we're jumping into the middle of a story. I feel like this is going to really hit home for you today. Nehemiah has started the work of rebuilding the walls of the city. The enemy couldn't stop him from starting. But if the enemy can't stop you from starting, he will try to distract you when you're close to the finish. And we are so, see, we're not just entering into a new building. We are entering into a new season as well. And God is about to elevate not just this house, but everyone connected to this place. And I'm excited to share this with you. So let's go to Nehemiah chapter six, verse one. And I'm reading from the New King James Version today. It says this. It says, now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that we had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem sent to me saying, come let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times and I answered him in the same manner. Then Sambalat sent his servants to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And it was written this. It is reported among the nations and Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. But then I sent him a message saying no such thing as you are saying is being done. I love this. It says, but you invent them in your heart. I think the NIV says it this way. You're making this stuff up in your head. Now, watch what he prays. The Bible says, for they were all trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. I love this prayer. So he says this. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Can we say that together? Strengthen my hands. Father, in Jesus name, we ask you to speak today. We need a word from you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. What an incredible story this is. Nehemiah is such an incredible figure in the history of Israel. And he rebuilds the walls in the city because God puts this burden on his heart to do so. As a matter of fact, he's got another job. This isn't even his job. This is something he is doing on the side because he's following the leading and direction of the Lord. He actually has worked for a king named Artaxerxes as a cupbearer. Now, cupbearer is a really interesting uh, job in the Bible um, because this guy would have been basically uh, tasting wine for the king and food for the king to make sure it wasn't poison. But at this time, we know that people know that kings have cupbearers. So this guy is basically living a good life, just tasting wine and food all day. Because if you, if, if, you, if you kill a cupbearer, you kill a cupbearer. Then the king knows I'm not supposed to. So it's, it's not that dangerous anymore. So Nehemiah, actually, I believe this is all assumption. I think Nehemiah's got a cushy job. He loves this thing. He's, Nehemiah's a little bougie living in the palace, just doing his thing, drinking wine, sipping wine, talking to the higher ups, living his life. And all of a sudden, God puts this burden on his heart. And I love Nehemiah because he represents a man who doesn't fall in love with what God did more than he falls in love with why God did it. And I came to talk to some people today who have maybe fallen in love with what God did. And now you're living frustrated, even though you are living in a dream you once prayed for. What happened was you fell in love with what God did instead of why God did it. And you really listen to me. You really start. To walk in purpose when you live in the why and not the what. Why did God do that? God put Nehemiah in this position because God needed access to what the king had. So he placed Nehemiah in a very, very particular position so that Nehemiah could get what God needed to do, what God wanted to do for the people. And that's when you'll start to really experience your purpose is when you realize that God has done this for someone else other than me. 
That's why you are where you are. So Nehemiah doesn't even live in Jerusalem. He's got a great job and he feels this burden. So he goes to begin to build the walls. He's got all the resources necessary. He's got the people necessary. He has all of the things that he needs, but he's got to get the right mindset in this people who have lived such defeated lives for so long. So, so much of the process of rebuilding is getting the people in the right mindset. It's not that they don't have the resources. The resources are there. It's not that City Light doesn't have the resources. The resources will always be in this room. We have what we need. It's just, do you have the mindset to see what God has given you to help us do what he's called us to do? Now, this is, this is wild because he has, he has almost finished the work. We are, we, are, we are just a few weeks in. This thing gets done in 52 days. We are almost finished, and the enemy launches one more strategic attack to stop the work. Now notice what the enemy does here. This is how he works. The Bible tells us that when the enemy saw that there were no cracks or gaps in the wall, he sent a message to Nehemiah saying, hey, come out here to the plain of Ono. We'd like to meet with you. Because the enemy knows this. He knows if he cannot get in, he's gonna try to draw you out. Any blood-bought, redeemed children of God in the room today, would you make them make a little bit of noise? Come on, let the redeemed of the Lord say so for just a second. You're blood-bought. You know this. The enemy cannot get in, but what he will try to do is draw you out. If you've been saved by God, he cannot take your salvation from you, but he can make you think you're not saved. So he tries to draw you out of position tries to draw you out of what God has placed you in because he cannot get in, so he will try to draw you out. And I came to tell some people today, now is not the time to move. Now is the time to stay in position and let's finish this thing, come on, that God has called us to finish. He would love nothing more than over these next few months to get you distracted, to get you offended, to get your feelings hurt, to get you off, to throw you out, to get you out of God's house, to get you out of prayer, to get you out of position. Because what he cannot steal from you, he will let you destroy and rob yourself of. And he can't take what God wants to do. He cannot take it, but he can take us out of it. And we'll be standing on the sidelines watching God do something that we dreamed of him doing and we knew he could do, but we got distracted over the last little bit. And I I just came to tell some people today, this is not the time to get distracted. It's the time to lean in more than you have ever leaned in before. Meet me on the plains of Ono. I think the title of the place he wants to meet should just give us a clue. Oh, no. You ever found yourself like in an oh, no situation? Oh, no situations. Oh, no situations are not really issues of temptation. They're actually issues of position. I want to show you something really quickly. You, you... The enemy doesn't always use your temptation to destroy your life. The enemy very often gets you out of position to destroy your life. So for some of you, what you see as a sin issue is actually an issue of position. It's like the person who comes out of the bar and they're like, God, why don't you take this desire from me? God, why don't you do something about this? And God is like, I told you to resist the devil and he will flee from you. You keep putting yourself in a position and you want to blame God like it's his fault. And God said there are some things that no matter how strong you think you are, you cannot win unless you stay away from them. There are some things that mean you harm. See, here's the thing we have to understand here about Nehemiah. He recognized they meant to do him harm, so he said, I'm not going there. He didn't assume God was going to protect him in a place he wasn't supposed to be. And and I, 
I think I live in, I, I think we are living in the city of Ono. Yeah. It's easy to find yourself in some places you should not be. And so God is trying to, try, trying to tell you, listen, some things are an issue of positioning, not temptation. There's a story in the Bible about a man named Joab and Abner. And the Bible says about Abner, David says this about Abner in 2 Samuel chapter 3. He says about Abner that Abner died foolishly. He's lamenting at his funeral and he says, this guy died like a fool. Why did he die like a fool? Well, if you look up where Abner died and who killed Abner, you get a little bit of a clue into why David felt this way. Joab, who was one of David's mighty men, is actually pursuing Abner. Abner had killed Joab's brother. It was in self-defense. And there are laws in scripture that teach us that if you kill someone in self-defense, you can actually flee to what were called sanctuary cities in the Bible. And Hebron is a city that Abner is in. He's in a sanctuary city. But the Bible says that when Joab shows up, he actually calls, <laughs> Joab calls Abner to the gate of the city. He gets him right on the outside of the city and he executes him there on the outside of the city. Because as long as you were in the city, you were safe by the law. But when you stepped outside of the city, I'm just telling you there are some things where you're thinking God's going to protect me in them, but he doesn't protect you in every situation that you put yourself in. You have to understand that there are some things that he is. He didn't just put the Holy Spirit on the inside of me to keep me from temptation. He put the Holy Spirit on the inside of me to keep me from some places that are going to destroy my life. Because listen to me, it's, it's one thing. To fall in the parking lot, it's another thing to fall at the Grand Canyon. Same, same thing. You tripped, you fell. But it's one thing to fall out here in the parking lot. You're going to get some bumps and bruises. But you fall at the Grand Canyon in the same way, it's a completely different outcome. And so I came to tell some people today, I think some of the issue that you're dealing with is not that the enemy is so strong, not that the enemy is so powerful, not that God isn't involved in your life. I think some of the issue is you're just finding yourself in places you shouldn't be anymore. And you're like, that's Old Testament, New Testament, come out from among them. And be ye separate, says the Lord. Then I will be your God and you will be my people. You can be immature and go to heaven, but you cannot be immature and experience heaven on earth. Can't do it. Don't die like a fool. I think one of the things that I recognize in my own life is that I like to, um, I like to live kind of on the ledge, <laughs> right? When I was young, I, I, I would ask my youth pastor, like, if, if I had a girlfriend, like, what can we do? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> what can we do? and not go to hell. <laughs> so he would tell me, and I would walk right up to that line. Some of you are getting nervous right now. You're like, that guy's got too much gray hair to fall off that stage right now. Walk right up to that line and just kind of dip my foot. And as I've matured, I've learned some things about myself. I'm 45 years old. You believe this? 45. You're like, you look like 55, but 45, <laughs> we'll believe you. I'll show you my birth certificate. I carry it with me because people don't believe me anymore. I'm a grandpa two times, by the way. <laughs> two times. Tiger and Teddy. Then yeah. So I like to live on the edge, but I've, I've learned some stuff about myself, and I'm still learning some stuff about myself. At 45, you would think I'd be more mature than I am right now. If you want to see me fall and fail, 
in life. I'll tell you what to do. Just fly to Johnson City, Tennessee. Go to Science Hill High School about 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. And just turn your camera phone on. Just point it in my direction. And watch me watch my son play basketball. If I'm going to blow it, that's why I'm going to blow it. And I found some stuff out about myself. Like, there are some things I cannot do and be successful at these basketball games. There are some things I cannot do and be saved at these basketball games. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I will lose my mind. One of the things I cannot do is I cannot sit with the parents from my team. Because I have, I have some ears on me that can hear everything. So my son is out there taking a shot, makes a bad pass, and the parents, you know what I'm talking about? Like, you should, you should have shot that, should have passed it. What are, what are you doing? <laughs> so I, I have learned that I, I cannot do that. Meanwhile, their child is out there throwing layups over the backboard, and I'm saying nothing. So I, I found out I have to sit completely isolated from those parents. Now, if, if I sit with them and then I get in my car and my wife gets mad at me and we have an argument and she's like, you lost your cool. Why did you do that? And I go, but them, who's really at fault, them or the guy who knows what he's made of and where he should have been and what he should have avoided. Come on. Let me give you another little tip about basketball. My son Oliver came to me the other day and he said, Dad, he said, um, my basketball, well, this was, this was back in the winter. My basketball keeps uh, being deflated. Like every, every day I go to get it and go outside and play, there's, there's less air in it. I think it's got a leak. And so we had filled it up for about three or four days in a row. And, and I started to realize, no, no, no. It's not that you are losing air. There's not a leak. The issue is where you are keeping the basketball. Now, Johnson City is not like Las Vegas. <laughs> it can get down into the single digits in Johnson City. So what we found out is he's keeping the ball in the garage and overnight it's it's not losing air because of a leak. It's losing air because in that cold environment the air decompresses. So what I found out as I was growing up because you, have you ever tried to, to to pump your basketball up and you can't find the needle? It's like <laughs> It's like you can either find the needle or you can find the pump, but you can never find the needle and the pump. Who are these evil people who are unscrewing the needle? These OCD, obsessive compulsive serial killers who are unscrewing it and putting them both in separate locations. I... But what I found out growing up is you could take a basketball and you could throw it into a dryer. Don't try this at home. Your mom will kill me. You can take a basketball and throw it into the dryer and you just run it in that heat for a little bit and the air inside of it will start to expand. It's not that it gets more air inside of the basketball. It's that the air inside of the basketball starts to expand. So no wonder the Bible says he baptizes us with Holy Ghost and with fire. So instead of finding yourself in positions out there, what you need is to find yourself in the positions where the fire is so that the Holy Spirit on the inside of you can expand and you can become who God has called you to be. You need to put yourself in an environment like this where there's fire in the room because the Holy Spirit needs fire to activate. Holy Spirit, activate. Get in the fire. Get in a room where, the, where it's burning, where it's hot, where the word is being preached, where people are worshiping God. 
And we're moving into an era where people are, are, are I, just, I just want more traditional stuff. No, 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 we need the fire of God. I want to be in an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit is reverenced and we, we still believe in the gifts and we, we still speak with other tongues and we still talk about miracles and we still believe that everything can change. We still believe in a God who does the supernatural. I need the fire of God for the Holy Spirit to thrive on the inside of me. So there are some things that happen in our life because we're out of position. Some things that we are paying for because we're not paying attention, someone said. I think if you treated your bank account like you treat your heart, your bank account would be broken too. I've noticed that a lot of people have more protection for their house than they do their own life. It's like I got sensors on every single window and door in my house. You can't walk in a door or climb in a window without me knowing about it. But you just let anybody have access to your life. You're just meeting anybody in Ono. So the Bible says he knew they meant to do him harm. Hmm. Am I 13 minutes over? Because that's red. Okay. I have 13 minutes. My God in heaven. I was just it's about passed out. All right. Okay. <laughs> So he knew, the Bible says, they meant to do him harm. Proverbs 3 and 5 says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So what I'm finding out is I have to fight not just temptation. I have to fight my lean. So the Bible says there, there, there are sins and there are weights that easily beset us, trap us, get us caught up. So every issue that God wants to deal with you about is not just sin. Sometimes what God wants to change about you is not evil, it's just inferior. So the Holy Spirit doesn't just come into your life to convict you of the bad stuff you are doing. The Holy Spirit comes into your life because sin is not just, it's not just immoral, it's also settling for less than the mark. And God has a mark that he has set for your life. And the Holy Spirit comes to make sure you don't settle for an inferior life. It's kind of easy to see when you're sinning. It's kind of hard to see when you are settling. No one wants to settle. No one woke up this morning and goes, I just want to settle. But we eventually do because we refuse to grow. We refuse to let the Holy Spirit speak to us, not just about the wicked stuff we are doing, but the stuff that is actually holding us back. It wouldn't have been wicked to go to, oh no, it wouldn't have been sinful or immoral. It just wouldn't have been God's best. And you are really limiting what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life if you are limiting him to just convicting you of immoral behavior. As a matter of fact, you will have to worry less and less about immoral behavior when you stop settling for inferior behavior. This was the problem with Israel. When Jesus shows up on the scene, he, he's like, I have this new thing for you. And they're like, no, we love the old thing. We really like this Moses guy. Jesus is like, but someone greater than Moses is here. Yeah, who, who do you think you are? How do you even know who Abraham is? They said to Jesus. Well, before Abraham was, I am. You know all Abraham's ideas? This guy. One greater than Moses is here. But they chose to embrace what God had done instead of what he was doing. And Nehemiah says, listen, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to give you the opportunity to take me backwards. I'm too busy with my hands on what God is doing in my life. So I'm going to give you some ways to make sure you don't settle today. Number one, stop looking backward. My dad said this recently. I thought this was so powerful. My, I asked my dad the other day. I said, Dad, he's, 
He's nearly 70 years old, and God has still used him. I was like, Dad, how do you, how do you still have such strong vision, like at 70? You still, man, this guy will get in a car, drive nine hours to preach in a little bitty church somewhere. He's just on fire. How do you, how do you live like that? He said, son, my dreams are greater than my memories. I said, he said, as long as you have dreams that are greater than your memories, you will always have a vision. Stop looking backwards. I was talking to somebody the other day and I was, I was trying to encourage them to embrace the new thing that God was doing in their life. And, and their frustration was they wanted God to do a, a newer kind of version of the older thing that he had done, like a refurbished kind of thing. And he was like, I just wish that I could go back. I just wish that God would, would do, do what he did. And, and I love Revelation 21, five, because it says Jesus kind of sits and he, he looks around and he goes, behold, I do a new thing. Isaiah says, I'm doing a new thing. Will you not perceive it? God doesn't just refurbish old things. God is the God who can do something brand new in your life. And sometimes in order to stop going backwards, you have to fully embrace the new thing that God wants to do in your life. So the Lord spoke to me in that moment. I looked at him and I said, God doesn't want to give you what you had. This is why God doesn't want to give you what you had, because what you had is why you're here in my office. The way it was is why you lost your mind. The way it was, the way it was is why you ended up on drugs. The way it was is why you ended up drinking so much. The way it was is why you're here complaining about your current life. God doesn't want to get it back to the way it was because if he brought it back to the way he was, you'd end up back here. God wants to do something brand new in your life. Embrace the new. Embrace today. I cannot keep going backwards. I cannot. It'll never be what it was, but that doesn't mean it won't be better. <laughs> I love what he says. Number two, he embraces the great work. He said, I can't come down. I got great work going on here. And I think the issue for many people in the room is they don't feel like their work is great. And the day we live in, it doesn't help that you can get on social media and see people doing what you really want to do with your life. And it just makes your life feel even more inferior to theirs. But here's the thing I found out about great work. Those who believe they're doing great work are doing great work. <laughs> because everything is about perspective. You could, you could walk into my shoes and be disappointed because you don't have the right perspective about what I'm doing. A lot of people are like, man, I, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy if I was you too, man. You get to do that. You get to stand up there in front of people and do all that stuff. Yeah, but the problem is, is there are a lot of people who do what I do taking their life. Because it's not great work unless you see it as great work. So it doesn't matter what you do. The Bible says, do whatever your hand finds to do. Do it unto the Lord with everything that you have got. It becomes great when you add great faith to it. So whatever you're doing, whether you're flipping burgers or you're working in a high rise, whatever you are doing, add great faith to it and watch God turn it into something great. You will never maximize an opportunity you belittle. And this is what they were trying to do in this story. They come to them multiple times and they make fun of the work. You're like, oh, no, they, 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 they finished because the thing they were doing was great. No, they weren't building massive buildings like this. They were building little walls with some doors. But it became great because their faith was great. <laughs> and the enemy, he came along one time in Nehemiah chapter four. He comes along and he says, even if a little bitty fox climbed up on that wall, their little stone walls would fall to the ground. And I know the enemy makes you want to feel that way. Makes you want to feel like the thing that you are doing is not significant. Like it doesn't matter. Nobody sees it. Nobody's watching it. Even just a little push or a little wind blew, it would knock your little project over. But what you are doing will never become great if you continue to belittle it. 
If you're doing something that is work and it is honorable and it is not sinful, it is great. And it becomes supernatural when you add faith to it. The, the Bible says that they nullified the word of God because they didn't add and mix it with faith. It didn't accomplish what it was supposed to accomplish because they didn't mix it with faith. And your job will never accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish until you put faith on it. Proverbs 13, 16 and 3 says, commit your work to the Lord. How do I commit my work to the Lord? One of the best ways to commit your work to the Lord is to give in the house of God. You got to tithe and you got to give offering. Why do I need to do that? Because what I do when I give to the work of the Lord is I make my temporary job of eternal significance. All of a sudden, what I'm doing from Monday through Friday, from 7 a.m. to 5 or 6 p.m. in the afternoon, I, it becomes eternally significant when I connect it financially to what God is doing. Hmm. Of Jesus' 132 public appearances, 122 were in the marketplace. Of the 52 parables Jesus told, 45 had a workplace context. Of the 40 miracles he did, uh, the church did in the book of Acts, 39 of them were in the marketplace. Jesus spent his adult life as a carpenter until the age of 30. He went into preaching ministry out of the workplace and into another form of work. 54% of Jesus' reported teaching ministry arose out of issues posed by others in the scope of their daily life experience. St. Bonaventure said this. He said, his doing Jesus, his doing nothing wonderful for the first 30 years of his life was in itself a kind of wonderful. <laughs> work in its different forms is mentioned over 800 times in the Bible. More than all the words used to express worship, music, praise, and singing combined. John 5, 17, Jesus says, my father is always at work to this day and I am working too. Nehemiah said they did all of this to distract us, to weaken our hands so we wouldn't finish the work. So he said, Father, strengthen my hands. As a person who's battled with a lot of mental health issues, pretty severe depression at some points in my life, anxiety to the point where I couldn't come out of my office on Sundays to preach. I, I, I would sit in a chair and my hand, someone would literally have to pull me up. Most of the time it was my wife and drag me into the building. You know what the enemy was trying to keep me from? The work. Because when I put the work in, I can sit in that chair anxious and nervous, and my hands shaking, thinking, I don't know if I can do this today. But I get up here and I put this mic in my hand and I get to work. I become a different man. He wants to keep you from the work. He wants to keep you from seeing the greatness of your work. And he wants to keep you from connecting that work to the work of the Lord. So your prayer, I love it because he doesn't go strengthen my mind. Strengthen my hands. So many of the issues of our mind have to do with where are my hands? We stand with me today. We have a job to finish. We're not just trying to finish a building. People finish buildings all the time. We're trying to build something that lasts generations. Because when I stand in this room, I'm not just seeing you. 
I'm seeing generation after generation after generation. I can't wait for the day when my grandkids come out here and visit. And then my grandkids' grandkids come out here and visit. 